Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where the Wonder Woman 2 story, or saga, I think at this point, takes an interesting turn and potentially unfortunate one. Now, for weeks, everyone's been saying, what's taking Warner Brothers so long to sign Patty Jenkins? It must totally be the studio's fault. They're not giving this very talented and groundbreaking director what she wants and what she deserves, right? That's been the narrative. But a story came out yesterday morning, which I think changes the narrative to show that it might be, at the very least, a situation that's being caused by both sides. And that's that Patty Jenkins has decided to take her capital that she earned on Wonder Woman 2 and not only spend it on television, but on TNT, which I think is absolutely shocking. And even more shocking is that she's taking Chris Pine with her. So that could potentially really hold up Wonder Woman 2, and for TNT. And get this, this is a show, we'll talk about what the show is specifically in just a moment, but this limited series idea, it's about, it's gonna be about six episodes, was turned down by everyone else, which is why it's on TNT. It's not like they were like, this is, TNT is a great partner for us. A ton of places turned it down. The trades only named one specifically, FX, but FX didn't want it. Who would turn down a Patty Jenkins, Chris Pine television show in a post Wonder Woman world, unless it was truly awful. <laughs> so, it, you know, but she really wants to make it. And apparently so does Chris Pine. They're doing it. And I think that potentially that could be what's maybe to some degree holding up Wonder Woman 2. And that might be why uh, Warner Brothers announced the release date uh, also this week in an attempt to force negotiations and say, now we have to make this release date that we've picked, which is already two and a half years after the first movie. That's a long time. Uh, and then if it doesn't work out, they can say, to, well, Patty Jenkins you know, didn't prioritize Wonder Woman 2, uh, which would also seem ridiculous. So I hope she knows what she's doing. And boy, must, she must be really good in a room, or at least maybe Chris Pine owes her. I mean, she's not good enough in a room to sell this project to anyone but TNT, this television uh, limited series. But Chris Pine has said that the reason he pl agreed to play Steve Trevor is that Patty Jenkins did such a good job pitching him the movie. And she acted the whole thing out right before him, and he was really impressed. Uh, so either she did a great job acting out this TV show, but only Chris Pine this time saw the beauty in it, or he's like, you know, this is like I would say because Star Trek hasn't maintained, this is now the biggest hit of his career, he could very well feel he owes her. Just like Margot Robbie clearly feels that she owes David Ayer because she agreed to have him direct Gotham City Sirens. Something that seems to be quite in question, but you know, David Ayer, at the very least, isn't going down without a fight because he tweeted out a picture of Harley Quinn the other day after those, those rumors began to percolate to show that he, ain't, at least, the very least, he ain't going nowhere willingly. So what is this television show that Patty Jenkins must make for TNT? I can't get over that it's on TNT. I'm like, what do you think's gonna happen? TNT will suddenly miraculously become a home for award-winning content? I don't know. I think that that's uh, kind of ridiculous, especially when you hear the show. I wouldn't pick this up. So Patty Jenkins, it's her and her husband. How many f successful women are gonna be brought down by trying to employ their husbands? You know, Melissa McCarthy's having the same problem uh, with her husband insisting to work with him as a director. And every time she does, it does not work out. It gives her a weak entry in her career. Uh, but she continues to do it. <laughs> ben Falcone, that's her husband's name. Well, Patty Jenkins' husband, uh, uh, Sam Sheridan, he's an author, They he wrote this and they've developed it together. And uh, it's called One Day She'll Darken. And what it is, is that it's about, it's very complicated. It's, like, it's basically, the hook is the Black Dahlia killings, right? but they're, they're going at it at a weird angle. So it's based on the autobiography of apparently a real woman who was given up for adoption, well, given up as a baby to a uh, African-American restroom attendant in 1949, Nevada, right? So years later, she's deciding to look into her past, you know, who she is. And for some reason that takes her into the path of the Black Dahlia killings, that investigation. And she runs into a character that Chris Pine will be playing, who is a former Marine turned disgraced reporter slash paparazzo, who is looking to find redemption also in investigating these killings. I don't know, but I mean, again, it would have to be such drivel to turn down the, Pat the Patty Jenkins, Chris Pine follow-up to Wonder Woman. I think that the, 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 the flood of no's should have been an indication to them to drop it. But no, they insist, and it's going to go on TNT. You know, maybe Patty Jenkins and her husband Sam Sheridan and Chris Pine will have the last laugh. 
and everyone will end up loving it. But I don't know, it doesn't look so good now. And if she holds up Wonder Woman 2 or misses the boat on Wonder Woman 2 to make this, I don't think a lot, a lot of people will care how good it is because it's very integral. I think that she'd be involved in Wonder Woman 2 I th because of how much, how much she helped the first film. But, you know, um, the, you know they got rid of uh, the screenwriter, which I think is just so incredibly tragic, Alan Heinberg. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen with Wonder Woman 2. We shall see. But I'm curious, how does this show sound to you? If you were Patty Jenkins and Chris Pine, uh, would you do this show on TNT? And what do you think it means for Wonder Woman 2? And does it make you feel any different about... I'm surprised that nobody else connected the dots about this story. Uh, you know, how that's potentially a, a little bit of a problem for the Wonder Woman 2 negotiations and scheduling. Uh, and good for Warner Brothers to try and force, their ha uh, force her hand by setting a date. All right, so anyway, that's the first story of the day. What a juicy one. Now, the second one is about how award season is starting to take shape. Finally! And that's with the lineup of the Toronto International Film Festival, which has really become the top awards festival. Sundance is really good at, you know, early on in the year, having some breakout hits, but they don't always... It's so far out, uh, early, it's so early, that they rarely materialize. I mean, sometimes it works. Uh, we'll see how The Big Suck does. Uh, the Big Sick, sorry. The Big, the big Sick does. And of course, um, uh, you know, Birth of a Nation, Nate Parker's movie came from Sundance, but of course, infamously imploded last year with his personal situation. But Toronto, though, because it's so, it's like it's um, in the fall, it's, you know, right when awards season is kicking off, it has really become the place to showcase your, your awards competitor. Like, for instance, last year, La La Land won the People's Choice Award, which has long been an indicator for the winner of Best Picture. It doesn't guarantee it, but it certainly gives you an advantage. Uh, La La Land didn't win. You know, it almost did. <laughs> but, you know, it certainly did quite well during awards season. And then Lion was the first runner-up for the People's Choice Awards, and that didn't really win anything, but it got a lot of nominations. Also at Toronto last year, Moonlight, which ended up, of course, winning, Arrival, Edge of 17, Loving, Manchester by the Sea, Nocturnal Animals, and Iran's The Salesman, which went on to win Best Foreign Film, all were all were part of um, the festival. So as you can see, it's the place to be. So these are the films this year that are uh, going to be playing, and I think are the emerging as the front runners for award season. So there's Darren Aronofsky and Jennifer Lawrence's Mother, which is uh, really you know about to come out like in a month. The trailer will debut. It turns out next week, late next week. George Clooney and Matt Damon's Suburbicon, Battle of the Sexes with Emma Stone and uh, Steve Carell. Margot Robbie's I, Tanya. I'm very excited to see how that has turned out. Uh, and then also, second tier, Stronger with Jake Gyllenhaal, the boss, his uh, Boston Marathon film. You know, uh, Mark Wahlberg uh, competed last year, didn't really work out. Uh, it had a lot of buzz for like a hot, hot, a hot moment there, but it didn't, you know, pan out. Uh, but so we'll see if Stronger, I didn't get to react to the trailer because I was traveling when it debuted, but I thought Jake Gyllenhaal looked quite good. He's a very good actor. He's very, uh, very magnetic on screen. And then also from Sundance, Call Me By Your Name, uh, featuring Army Hammer and Timothy Chalamet about, a, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a gay romance, but it's very privileged. You know, it's like the exact opposite of Moonlight. And so I don't know if the, uh, if the Academy in particular will want to go in the same direction this year, particularly with like a privileged version of that story, right? Uh, Timothy Chalamet's character, you know, having feelings for Army Hammers, like uh, in, I believe, Italy, you know, at an archaeological dig that Timothy Chalamet's father is running and, you know, um, it's uh, certainly a very, you know, I don't know. We'll see. It got a lot. It seems like it's been done before in Hollywood, uh, but it got a lot of attention at Sundance, like a lot of attention. So it's a, it's a, it's going to certainly maybe be nominated. So those are the films that are starting to emerge, uh, and it's very exciting indeed. Uh, also, on a side note, Wonder Woman, apparently, they're going to run a big uh, awards campaign for Wonder Woman. But I don't know. I think if they push too hard, they could have a backlash, so they better be careful. And if Patty Jenkins messes up Wonder Woman too. Uh, I think that's going to hurt her as well. So anyway, uh, the third story of the day is, speaking of awards season, that Logan Lucky, which for the most part has very good reviews, uh, last uh, last we checked, 100% on Rotten Tomatoes. I had problems with it, interestingly enough, with the script, and that's the story that developed yesterday. And that's about the screenwriter who's credited Rebecca Blunt. Uh, everybody, you know, she's a first-time screenwriter, has no other credits. Uh, she's been getting a lot of praise for the film, although, as I said in my review, I felt that the final act, the third act, fell apart and that it was, you know, not so surprising considering that it was a first-time screenwriter. But now it's been revealed by The Hollywood Reporter 
uh, that Rebecca Blunt might be a pseudonym. And who is it a pseudonym for? And there are a couple of theories. It's very interesting. Now, the first, uh, and what makes it even more interesting is that even the cast believe that Rebecca Blunt was a real person, not a pseudonym for anyone that they knew, which would be the case uh, if, as we discuss this, you'll see. But they even exchanged emails with her thinking that she lived in the UK and that's how she was discussing the script with everyone. That seems like a crazy ruse. And I would even be concerned that that story could overtake the film itself. Uh, it seems very gimmicky to me. I'd be curious to see how voters react to this. Will they think it's so clever or will they be like, uh, isn't your movie good enough that you don't need to pull a stunt like that, right? So anyway, one theory is that Rebecca Blunt is Soderbergh's wife, Jules Asner, former e-host, who's never written a screenplay before, but in 2008 did write a novel. That was a long time ago. That means like in almost 10 years, she hasn't written another novel. But maybe she wrote the screenplay. Who knows? Some people believe it might be Steven Soderbergh himself, because of course he has used pseudonyms before as a cinematographer and an editor. That would, to me, would seem perhaps the most likely. Uh, and also, it would make sense that he would be unable to edit himself as the director because he wrote it. You know, he wouldn't see the flaws in the third act. Uh, by the way, for those of you who are like, but Grace, it has 100% Rotten Tomatoes. You have to remember that 100% Rotten Tomatoes just means 100% positive reviews. And even though I had a problem with the third act, my review would count as positive on Rotten Tomatoes. So you have to look at the actual like number score on Rotten Tomatoes to see what, it, what it's getting in that regard, not just the uh, fresh to Rotten Tomato ratio. All right, so uh, the other theory, the third theory, is that it's another e-host, John Henson, who's friends with Asner, Soderbergh's wife, who it was reported was working with Soderbergh on a similar script years ago. So that might have resurfaced. So we'll see. I mean, I really feel that acting sells the movie, and so I won't know if it would get nominated for scripts. I mean, it has really good lines and moments, you know, really good lines at certain moments. Like, really, really good, as I mentioned in my review. But I feel like the third act is such a problem, and the pacing, and the moment, the momentum. Someone said, oh, you know, you fix a film with editing, not reshoots. Well, I feel this, the, the third act missed, didn't have enough story. Like, I don't think you could save it with editing. You needed more stuff in there, or some restructuring from a narrative standpoint. So I think it's a fabulous first screenplay, or, you know, whatever number this is for Soderbergh, uh, but I don't think it's award-worthy. I think it may be feather in the cap worthy, but I don't think it's awards worthy. And if I were to nominate anybody from this movie, maybe Daniel Craig, because he's so outside his comfort zone. But I would, you know, I think Adam Driver should also be considered if they're going to go starting to nominate Logan Lucky for awards. All right, then for the viewer question comes from Michael Kent. And we're going to circle back to Wonder Woman because uh, he had a question about release dates. So Michael says, Grace, what is the difference of summer release dates and winter release dates? Uh, what's its nature? So, you know, not understanding, you know, what does it matter when a film is released? You know, why, what makes, because I said when I was talking about the Wonder Woman 2 release date the other day, that it felt like a summer movie, not like a winter movie. So Michael wants some clarification on that. Great question. So Michael says, so, so that's what Michael said. So my response to that is, it's really the feel of the film and if it can meet how the audience is feeling at that time of year. Like in the summer, you want a big, fun, escapist film, right? With air conditions blasting, you've got your soda and your popcorn, your feet are up, it's hot outside. And you know, that's when you want something that's gonna mirror where you are. Oh, I wanna to escape to this beautiful climate. You know, like the mascara is so gorgeous in the summer, you know, right? Wonder Woman's running around in uh, a skirt. Uh, I don't like the metal metal bikini uh, or metal bathing suit comments that have been made lately, but it is a summer outfit, to be fair. Now, on a side note, I want to point out that uh, Avatar came out at the holiday season, and people liked that because it was escape from the cold weather to a warm climate. So I guess maybe Wonder Woman 2 could work, maybe potentially as a winter release date. Uh, but I also like to say, like, fall, by the way, as a movie season, works really well because everyone's feeling so productive, right? School is starting, work is starting back up in earnest after, like, kind of a pause in August. So that's why everybody thinks of awards films, right? You're like, oh, I'm going to be intellectual and have some heavy, smart films to watch, right? Although it has become a bit of a blockbuster season as well, this year particularly with Kingsman 2, It, etc. September's pretty packed. Uh, but I just, I think that, that also adds to the energy of the year, the year starting back up. But with the holidays, holidays are tricky because you have to compete with people's holiday plans. Uh, they have shopping, traveling, preparing for the uh, you know the different holidays people celebrate, and also family comes to visit. So people have a lot to do, uh, and they don't necessarily need to fill their time like let's say they do in the summer, right? Like in the summer, people have time to kill, and they often want to kill it at the movie theater. Although I think streaming is being very competitive and saying, why don't you kill it at home? Streaming a bunch of content. 
So anyway, a winter movie needs to really be something that, also that's why family movies do so well at that time of year because you need something the whole family can go and see. That's why Daddy's Home 1 did so well and Daddy's Home 2 will probably do very well because the whole family's together and they're like, let's all go see this film, which there's something for everyone in it. So Wonder Woman, I think maybe if they had a winter angle to it, maybe if she found herself, you know, if it is an 80s movie, you know, uh, dealing with the Cold War, you know, like she goes to Russia and everyone's like, oh, that's kind of Christmassy, right? That could potentially work. Uh, and also, I think there's something for everyone with Wonder Woman as the first movie proved, so who knows? It could, it could work. I don't think it's a horrible idea, but I don't think it's the best position for Wonder Woman 2 to be in. For instance, Frozen 2 will be incredibly competitive in the holiday space because of all that snow and ice, and Arendelle like, seems like a little Christmas village already, and it's got Olaf the talking snowman. It's very well positioned for a holiday release. So that's the difference of the different times of year in terms of release schedules, you know? Think about what's going on with people. Think about what, they, what, their, what their own lives are going on at that moment. Uh, how, what, what, why they go to the movies at that time of year. That's also sometimes why release dates are different in different parts of the world, right? I mean, we're getting more and more day and date because you know technology makes the, it a small world, right? So it's harder to, say, to keep secrets and stuff and people want it to watch the movie together, basically. But it used to be that you're like, well, like different countries have different breaks from school, right? And they have different like holidays, like China, for instance. I think their holiday either is right now or coming up, like their biggest, or maybe it's in, I don't forget, maybe it's in February, but there's like, a, like there's this, I think maybe it actually is in February. There's this crazy Chinese hol like holiday season that doesn't coordinate with anything else in the world, right? And I think also like in South America, their summer break is like when winter break is because of the change of seasons, you know, because of the, the, the planetary alignment. So it's really interesting. So, you know, sympathy for uh, dis uh, distributors and having to plan one to release their films. So I hope that answers your question, Michael, or at least gives you a little perspective on it. Thank you everybody for tuning in today. Please write down below what you think of today's top three stories, Michael's viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered on Monday, and of course any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.